I'm recording it because two of the people who wanted to be here today were on the quarantine list so they couldn't be here. So I'm just going to upload it, but it's not live. We don't have to worry about people asking questions on Zoom and stuff. The stuff can be live. So we get to be live and lower everything. Anybody need another minute just to set up and get ready? Is there a yeah, by the way, we we usually like been here for like two o'clock, eight to two. We'll be here till two, yes. Okay. If you need to leave early, just let me know. There is an exit directly underneath the classroom where your parents can pull up. I didn't open the gate, so it's a lie. Never mind. Um, we'll get you. We'll find out where you go. Um, but yeah, eight to two. Uh, we'll do these fifteen slides. We should be done around twelve, twelve thirty, and then the rest of the time will just be question and answer. Sign she everyone but seven signed in already. We can keep these, right? Yeah, those are for you to take home. Um, how many extras do we have? Just the one, two. Okay. If you make a mistake and you want to scavenge parts off of the extras, that's fine. Oh, Renee, those are all broken copies. Okay, the ones on my desk are the ones in there. Yes, ma'am. Sorry about that. Those are all on the time to check for this next week. All right, this is also the calculator for the EOC. So if you don't have one at home, you want to start practicing with this one. Come on up and grab one. If you want one. Anybody else over here? Yeah. Reese got it on, that's just Chloe, you got one. Yep. Okay. Um, I just want to use mine. All right, just to ease into it, we're going to start with topic 10, then we're going to go to topic 8. Topic 10 is going to be the most common question type on the EOC. Topic 8 is the third most common question type, but the number one question students ask me to go over. So I put that one ahead of the next topic. We're going to cover pretty much every topic except for topic 9 explicitly, but I will cover topic 9 while talking about topic 10. Um, topic 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 11. Yeah, we're very much going to cover the whole class in the next couple hours. But to do that, the first thing we've got to talk about just make sure we know our vocab here. And before we even get there, if you're watching the video on YouTube, there is a board on my left I'll be writing some definitions on. I'll upload a picture of it so you can reference it as we're going, but I can't show it both boards. Does anybody know the definition of a line? I know this sounds really silly to start there, but. pretty much covered every special case that we're going to need to know. So the word line means it continues in both directions forever. So we put this double-headed arrow here. A ray is a line with a definite starting point. That continues in one direction forever. Who hasn't signed in? Oh, I mean, just a couple. Three, you thought they were on camera. That was way too late to come starting point, and then it continues in some direction. So this is how we draw it. 
And then if we're talking about a ray, this is ray AB that starts at A. This would be line over CD. Now, C and D are somewhere on this line, but they can't possibly be on the endpoint because, well, there's no endpoint to a line. So if I'm drawing a line, I'm going to have to do this. And then I just have to show that C and D are somewhere on that line. Now this kind of goes back to what you did in Algebra 1. You pretty much almost exclusively dealt in lines that continued forever. And then you could find the slope between the two points, and that'll tell you how the line continues forever. And then our last one, which is the one we're going to primarily use in this class, is the line segment. That has two defined points, the end and the beginning of the end. showing that the line is at a specific starting point and a specific end point. This is the line segment, right? It stops here, starts here, stops here. I mean, they work either way, right? This could be the beginning. And then you can consider each of these magnets a new point on the line. And the slope between these is always going to be the same as we go through. So this is a line segment. I can't really show you a ray, can't show you a line in the real world because well, we don't have enough space or time to do that. So with that, would you call this a secant ray, line segment, line, what would this be here? Because we have to start by looking at, well, how is it expressed with the endpoint? What does that show us? Is that a line, a line segment, or a ray? Yeah, it's a line, right? It just continues in both directions forever. The difference between a chord and secant line is that the chord has defining endpoints and stopping points, right? The chord starts and ends on the circumference. Do you remember something? I can't see. Which part? I can't see the, the second part. Chord. And secant line. With the infant with the little micro. So this is that the secant line continues forever. But at the same time, notice that both only touch the circle twice. All right. Now, by this definition, what would you call the diameter? Is that a ray, a line segment, or a line? Uh, line segment. This is a line segment, right? Now. Is the diameter another one of these as well? The diameter actually plays two roles here. The diameter is also a chord because they both originate and end on the circumference. So today, or all year, you've heard of a bunch of times special cases, right? And you're gonna see that a few times today. The special case is where we have a word like chord but we have something much more important that also satisfies the definition of a chord in this instance, right, the diameter. But this has so many more applications. This is a special kind of chord. It has a further definition that we call it a special case. And here, a chord is the diameter if it passes through center. really 
quick, I'm going to check on the camera to make sure that I'm not outside of the bounds of that. Oh, way outside the bounds of that. There we go. No, yep. Okay. So if I say special case and you don't understand, you may say, oh no, it's not a special case, or why is it a special case? Just ask. Because the diameter is definitely a cord. And what's interesting about the diameter, this cord, as long as any cord passes through the center, they'll all be the same exactly. Right? If I measure this through the center, let it go through the center. We are at 46 centimeters across the circle. And if this is a true circle, which is being distorted, so oh, wonderful example here. So now, when we get to this comedy show, um, if this was an actual circle, because this is in 16 by 9, it looks like we're distorting our picture quite a bit. This is 34. Yeah, this is all by 30 over 34, 34. Anyways, had this been drawn correctly, um, these diameter, these two lines, I would be able to say, are congruent. Congruent just means the same length. We'll actually do a lot with congruent through here shortly. All right, what is, first, where is my eraser? There it is. There's one extremely important piece of information missing from this diagram. What is that? Does anybody know? What is that one piece, that one part of the circle that so much of this class is built on? Say it again? Yeah, it's the radius, right? Her name you scared me because I look at you and you look away right away. Um, so how about thank you? The radius is equal to one half times the diameter. So that just means if we know this goes straight across the circle and this is the center of the circle, this is the bicep, this is the midpoint. If this is the midpoint, then each side of this line where it cuts is equal. And the radius is going to be equal to the radius no matter where I draw it on this circle. So if I were to tell you that this is 6, and then I drew this line from here to here, for room, how long would this green line be? 6, perfect. Uh, Sydney, what about this green line? What would that be? What, what's the length of this line? 6, yes. We can keep doing that. There's an infinite number of these. Every one of these is going to be equal to Now, let me ask you this question. Does the radius fit any of our other definitions like chord, secant line? Is that any of those? Think about that for a minute while I just catch up on this slide.
this one and this one? Yeah. How are they different? Uh, no. Like, what are they? I don't know. So, a secant line is just a line which continues in both directions forever that passes through the circle at two different points. Okay. A chord touches and it starts and it stops on the circumference. So, if I were to look at the secant line and I were to say, find the, chord, find the length of this part, you would see that it would touch here and here, right? And then we can apply everything. From here to here is a chord, but since this continues forever, it's called a secant line. When you get to higher level math, there's a lot of stuff you'll do, like if this line passes through here, and I have another circle with this center, can we say that they are congruent? And then we'll learn more about that for you guys in like two years in pre-calc, if you go that route. So a secant line and a chord, functionally on the inside of a circle are the same thing. It's just we know what a secant line continues forever. And then we're going to get to the tangent line and why that's a little bit different than the secant line. In geometry, we don't deal with too much with the secant line, other than to help us see the difference between a chord and a tangent line. This is kind of the middle, middle of the road there. So, any questions so far before I talk about that tangent line, which is kind of where we're really going for, what we're setting up for. And then we'll talk about the other stuff, and then we'll move on. All right. So, we have another question. Yes. Like, if you're trying to solve some evaluation, For the area of a chord or the length of a chord? Uh, length of a chord. That's actually coming up in just a few slides. Um, let me do this first. And Bruno, I've got a question for you, sir. Yeah. If I put, if I take the secant line and I move it up, it'll still touch twice, right? Like if I move it up to here, it'll still touch twice, right? Yeah. What happens if I keep moving it up? Will it eventually get to a point where it only touches once on the circle? Yeah. Right. There's got to be a point of curvature where a straight line can only touch it at exactly one spot, right? This is really hard to conceptualize because when this happens, these lines, they are one dimension. We can't even represent a line correctly. It's infinitely thin, but it has length. There has to be a point. Brie, I keep standing in front of you. There has to be a point with that curvature of the circumference and the secant line. If I move it up enough, that the secant line will no longer touch the circle twice because there's just not enough curvature. That's what we call our point of tangency. This. This touches the circle only once. So a secant line pushed to the extreme all the way to the edge becomes a tangent line only when it touches the circle once. The value in that is knowing that on a coordinate plane, whatever, let's call this, well this is point T. Only if it touches it once, that's the point. If it touches it twice, it's just a secant line. We don't really have too much more to say. So what I'm going to write here is that point T and line segment, or sorry, line PT only at the same time and one point, at one point. And we can do some pretty interesting stuff with that, with that information. Now, I don't want to jump ahead of you guys. I don't want you guys to fall behind what I'm going to show you next. Has everyone had a chance to copy down? Raneem, I know you usually have really good notes, so let me know when you're finished copying it before I go to the next thing. 
And if anyone has questions before we move on, I mean, if we have questions, we've got plenty of time today. If we don't have questions, we'll be done by 11, and then we'll have three hours of Q&A. Please keep these all the way to the bottom of the screen. Yeah, so the way this whole presentation is set up is what I start with is what most of the EOT consists of. And then as we get towards the end, you'll see less and less of it. And at the very end, it's just gonna be things that you're gonna need across everything kind of to recap. This is 40% of your EOC are these types of questions. Free. Okay, so whenever like an extra was the lunch, like what are the extra about the lunch of the trailer? Oh, all the time. Yeah. So Bree's question. Bree's question is, will it ever ask us to find the length of a cord? And we actually have that problem coming up in a couple slides. I think let me double check. But we can do that. That's actually what I'm building up to right now, is how to find the length of a cord, how to find the length of the radius, how to do all of that. That's perimeter, but we need to find the length of that cord. Yep, so when we get to this slide, just remind me to add one number to this and we'll find the length of a cord. All right. Renee, good? All right. So, if I were to have this on a coordinate plane, you know, the x, y axis and all of that, this can be defined as, let's say, the point, um, yeah, we'll put it at zero, zero, right? And now, Bree was asking, how would we know the length of a chord? Well, from this, if I know, let's do this, because this is huge to know. The radius and the point of tangency meet at 90 degrees. So I'm going to actually put that on that board while you guys write that down. What I'm saying is, this radius, since it intercepts and my tangent line and my radius both exist at zero, zero, this creates a 90 degree angle. And now to Bree's question. Bree, are you okay with me being a little cheap on this one right now and saying that we know the diameter is a chord, right? And if I wanted you to find the length of the diameter, we're going to do that before we move on. Is that okay? Okay. So, a couple things fall out of this. Anytime two lines meet and they're perpendicular, and I'm trying to find the length of a side, the first thing I want to go to every time is to ask myself, can I use the Pythagorean theorem? That is a squared plus b squared equals for this one, we're going to do a couple of things we're going to add, and then we'll get to work on it. So let's call this diameter of chord AB. We already have this defined as 2. If I were to tell you that the radius is 3, and line segment PA, remember this means the length of T, line segment PA is mm. well I guess if I set it up this way Bree I'm kind of cheating you out of it Bree if the radius is 3 what's the length of the diameter what? Yeah, it's good. Three, that's the length of the oh. That's it. Now, so that's really how we're going to do the diameter there, right? Remember, this line is equal to every line that starts at the center and touches. So if this is three, this is three, this is three, and since this starts and ends here, and this one starts and ends here, I can add them together. 
my core things they say. Now, I know what you're actually asking me is how do I find this code in place? That's what we're actually going to do coming up. I just didn't want to put too many numbers here yet, but that's how we would do it for you. Now, what I was slowly alluding to here, though, is where these meet, we have a 90 degree angle. So if I were to draw, well, we don't want to do that. That's going to be too complicated. Anyway, let me step back from that one and watch we'll you do it. So let me not do that right now. All right. All right. So let me ask Abby real quick. What is the difference between a secant line and a tangent line? And I know I'm putting people on the spot, and if you don't want to answer, you can always pass it to anybody else in the room, as long as you know their name. Just don't go like this, you. You can't say, hey, I don't know your name yet. So I'd like to pass it to you, and just say, hey, I'm Becca. And say, okay, Becca, can you answer that? But the question is, what's the difference between a secant and a tangent line? The secant line is the circle plus and the tangent line minus. Perfect. That's exactly what I was, yep, that's it. Uh, Barun, is the diameter of chords? Any questions about any of that, or can we move on to the next circle? Yeah. All right, we got a lot out of that 360 degrees. I've also lost my eraser. So I will say today you're going to ask Jeremy to say, where's my eraser more times than you need to hear in one day. You also see me start dropping a marker eventually and juggling it until it hits the floor. It's not a comedy show. It's just uh, I haven't been at the board but twice this year. All right. Bree, where do you want to go next? Middle circle or right circle? Middle. Middle, all right. That's because you want to see some links on the team, huh? No, okay. So let's talk about the parts of a circle. Right here, the entire circle, that green line is called the circumference. And we can do something like this. If I call this point A, then the circumference is just part A. That means I have to start at A, follow the arc until I get back to A. Not the best notation, and you probably won't see that. You will see the circumference is, right, because we know from A back to A is a full circle. When we start talking about what an arc is, The arc is just a portion of the circumference. So from here to here, is a portion of the circumference. And from here, we can pretty easily kind of derive the equation for arc length when it's in degrees based off of just this picture. Let's go to a little simpler idea. How would you guys write this as a fraction? There's three boxes. I filled in one, so what is that as a fraction? One third. It is one third, right? This is the part shaded over the parts of double. We can do the exact same thing here to find out the length of an arc by taking the, I'll just call it arc measure, because that's what we're going to say anyways. And dividing that by Chloe, how many degrees in a circle? 360. It's 360. So that's going to be my denominator, right? The whole thing is 360, so the sum of the degrees goes in my denominator. But I'm only looking at this part right here. 
that we'll call n, right? That's the arc magnitude. If I go back to what Hall told us is we have one part shaded of the three parts. How many degrees do we have shaded of the 360? I'm just going to put in here as a placeholder. Right. That's going to give me the percentage or the fraction of just the arc that I'm looking at. Now I jumped one huge thing. How do we calculate the circumference? What is that? It is 2 pi r. Yes, sir. What I have to kind of remember is we do have a mixed class with two different teachers. So I, in the mindset of where I was, but that's why I want to step back. So if I know that the whole circle is 2 pi r, but I only want to know this part right here in black. Well, this part can be represented as n over 360. And Say it again. That's exactly, yep. So my question is, what I'm saying is, this is how much of the circle. And the reason I'm writing that instead of saying it, because sometimes we miss it. What does the word of mean? Operator wise, add, subtract, multiply, divide. Multiply. It means multiply, right? How much of this do I want? Well, here's the part, the portion that I want. Here's the whole thing. This is something I'm multiplying. So how much is replaced with n over 360? And we have of multiply. The circle is in 2 pi r. And that is how we would find the arc length, which we're going to practice. But if you, in my mind, which was about to be all over the floor if I went down, in my mind, it's easier for me to think of it this way. This is just a portion of the arc length, of the old whole arc. So I can take the percentage, which is what this is, times the whole thing, and it's going to give me that length. For real. How do we, um, I have a question. Like, yeah, go for it. Instead of um, having over 360, why is it over what? Why, why do we have to have it like on like this? Right here? Yeah. So, how much is the entire circle? So let me ask you, if I wanted the whole circle, what would my fraction be then? It would be 360 over 360. And what does that simplify to? One. So we're looking at one whole circle, right? Yeah, but, but like... But, go ahead. Um, like, how, what happens if like the surface on 360? Do we just put it under? All right, that's a good question. He said, what if the circle's not 360? And that's going to be something we're going to talk about in topic six. But when we have a polygon, what are some rules here? They have to be closed. That means, let's put it over here. We're going to ask ourselves, is this a polygon? Yes or no? A polygon must be closed, and that's it. We can't leave anything open. Is that a is that a polygon? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It has more than three sides. Also, the number of sides must be greater than or equal to three. So one, two, three, four sides. If I add something inside, let's imagine there's an ant inside. I don't know. That's an ant. Could he crawl out of this if he wanted to? No, it's closed in. Three said yes a little bit, but she's thinking in 3D. We're just we're stuck in that box, right? Now, is that a polygon? No. Why not, Sam? Because it's not a polygon. Yep, if we can just imagine there's a golf person in there. But this guy's trying to run out, right? He thinks he's trapped. All he's got to do is take that step out. Now, Varun says, Sorry guys, this is now a polygon. Can you get out now? No. no. So then Varun, what your question was, is let's say the circle was 270 degrees, right? Yeah. That's 
that guy right there? Is it a polygon? So Varun had a really good question. Tons of insight there. I don't know if he even realized what he was going for. But everything I've said to you only works if this is a circle. And a circle, by definition, has 360 degrees. So if we were to change it to 270, we'd be looking at this. The problem with that is, what if I try to draw a radius from here to here? Does that work? No, because the radius has to start at the center and end on the circumference, right? But this is only 270 degrees, so we're kind of in trouble. So that is why the whole circle is always considered 360, and that's why that is set in stone. If it's not that, we're not looking at a circle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That was a really good question. Bree, go for it. Right here? This will find the length from this green mark to this green mark, the arc length. Oh. And what I was saying too, because Bruin brought up a really good point here, is for the area of a sector, if I were to color in this entire circle, that's 360 degrees, Left, right, top, bottom, 45 degrees, everything's colored in, right? That means I've covered 360 degrees. But here, I only want that portion. So again, this is N over 360. Something slightly changes, though. If I want the area, what do I have to multiply by? I'm no longer looking for the portion of the length here. I'm looking for the entire portion of this defined area. So instead, oh, I don't have a back button anymore. I have really too much. Sydney, what would you do? Why would you do pi r squared? And I'm not saying it, like no. you're wrong. I just want to hear your insight. Um, well, instead of trying to find the length of the area, I'm trying to find the area. That, and I'm the That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, we're switching now from one dimension, two pi r, two pi r squared. So I want the total area of the circle times the percentage of the circle that I'm actually looking at. So let's say this was a little neighborhood, right? Sydney lives here. I live, the thimble one is here. My daughter back there moves in here and here, right? Sydney has to go and she wants this beautiful green lawn. So she's paying somebody to take care of it. If she knows the total area of our block but she only wants to pay for enough service to keep her area green because we should be, right? You would calculate it by saying, well, if the whole block is this many square feet, I only want to portion my quarter of it, so I'm going to do one-fourth times the area, and that's what I should be contracted for. Now. So, wait, so just to go back to the um, I have a question. So do yep. you have, like, um, uh, do you Yeah. Varun heard me say that Sydney owns a quarter of the block, right? He said, so then wouldn't this just be 90 over 360? Yeah, in my hypothetical there, Sydney owns one-fourth, which is 90, times the area, and that's what she's going to call the maintenance people, and that's what she's going to contract for, one-quarter times pi r squared, of the block's total area to take care of. And then when, you know, Bree comes through the neighborhood. She's like, wow, this is a nice looking place. Ooh, no good, no good, no good. We're leaving, we're not buying it, right? Because Sydney takes care of it, but she doesn't want to overpay, so she calculates it that way. Now, Sydney, let me ask you this. Did you know this just from class when I was in there, or did it make more sense when I said start thinking about the portion times the whole? No, just new. Just new, okay. So this works in every dimension. If we had a sphere and I colored in a wedge, you could do the same thing. You could take the volume times n over 360 and go from there and go right up the chain. Yes? Question, about the polygon it says that it has to have uh, three or more sides. Yeah. Let's go to that polygon question. All right. Sorry. No, no, this is a really good idea here. So, 
Sydney's idea is, assuming that this is closed, you're identifying this as side one, and then from here to here, side two, right? Okay, let me ask you here, how do you define on this square the sides? The vertices. The vertices, right? So we're on the same page there. Same here, right? There's a vertex, we know it's a side. So you're saying, because there's two vertices here, it's two sides. All right, count the vertices, that's the test. Okay, now we're gonna go, and this is why I like it. Let me turn the camera just so I can make this point. Now that we know about the point of tangency, what does that create when it hits the radius? What, okay, when a tangent line hits an arc, what happens? Oh, it just goes in the same. Yep, right, so we can agree this is a semicircle. This is a tangent line, ooh, that's a secant line. We definitely have a vertex there, right? Now, I can draw an infinite number, and we're starting to talk about calculus, so every one of these has a tangent line, every one of these is a point of tangent. How many vertices does this have? Yeah, endless. So that's why I made sure to follow It has more than three sides. Every one of those points of tangency creates a new side. Wait, I have a question. You said that um, the, you, so you're just making a lot of secret points. Secret points. Only because I'm bad at drawing room. We have to, that's why I put the 90 degree angle here. It's only meant to touch once. I'm just not a machine. Now, Sydney, I'm gonna ask you this question. How many sides does a circle have? Endless, right? But did, would that have made sense to you before I showed you this? Would you have said endless here? Before, 20 minutes ago, would you say how many sides a circle has? Well, looking at it, you would say one. Well, right. Because what you're counting are these things. Like, you're looking at the image. Sorry, it's an image, but yeah. So the same idea can be applied there. Both have the same number of vertices, which is weird, right? Because that's half the size, but we'll learn about that in calculus. But does that make sense to the question? Okay. So a circle, a semicircle, all meet the requirements of a polygon because there's just an infinite number of sides. Um, sorry for those of you watching at home later. Looks like an earthquake, so I'm running to you. But I'm trying to keep it so that this glare is off. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Because again, this is where we want to spend most of our time. We're coming up on an hour, which is good. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead, sir. What will, the, what will um, in the EOC? How will they make this into a question? I wish I could say that. If I see the EOC, I can't teach the no, course. No, like, like, I just like, like for like the in that. In like a generic idea. Yeah. That's the next slide. In the next five slides, that's what we're gonna. Do. The way I wanted to handle today is make sure we master vocab. This is all the general idea. There's nothing specific here except for what I did for Brie with the three and the three to make six. If we can get the general idea here, you'll see that the specific question I'm about to ask should be so much easier, right? It's better to learn the big picture and then be asked how we do it. Varun, I'm gonna ask one more question then we're gonna move to this. When you told me that this had to be 90 over 360, Yesterday morning, would you have been able to put that same idea together? Or did it kind of just make sense when I said one fourth and then? Yeah. So you started actually thinking about the portion times the whole, right? That's why I want to concentrate on it this way. Any questions? You're looking a little overwhelmed. Do you want like a second to just process? And, are you good? Uh, yeah, you just want to Okay, when you want to any questions, you kind of have like an eye roll and a sign at the same time. And uh, um, one thing I try and do in my class is make sure that you guys know I have more questions about what we're talking about than you do, and it's perfectly fine to ask. All right. And let's get to the last one. So, does anybody know what kind of angle we have right here? What's the angle? 
What's the name of that name? What's the special type of name? Abby. Central angle. How did you know it was the central angle? Yeah, kind of. The vertex. Something really nice happens here. If the vertex is at the center, whatever this is, the arc measure is the same. So we should get congruent. We're going to take the words out of my mouth. Yes, they are congruent. This arc measure and, well, sorry, this angle measure and this arc measure are exactly the same. Yes, sir. So if I said that this was 30 degrees, what would this one be? Okay. If I said that this was 120, Varun, pick somebody in the room for me. You're up front and I keep picking on you because you're so much taller than I thought you'd be. If you don't know a name, I'm sure you can ask a name. Bree? Is that Bree? Bree, mm -hmm. are you overwhelmed because that eye will close you, pulled your bottom lid up to your top? If that arc measures 120, what's the central angle measure? Nope, that's inscribed. You're way ahead of us. Any central angle is always the same as the arc measure. So if this is 120, this is 120. Oh my God. Yeah. So if you're right angle, and this is only this, then this is the right angle. Farouk is saying this is looks more like the right angle. Is that what I heard, sir? It looks like the right angle. Okay, well, let's do that. Farouk, pick somebody for me, because this is your question. I guess. Renin. Okay, Renin. If the central angle is 90, or a right angle, what is the arc measure? Right. Perfect. Can we plug in the Pythagorean theorem? Nope, you don't have to. This is only looking for, if I were to measure this in degrees, they're always equal. The Pythagorean theorem is only going to talk about this side, this side, or if I connect this, the hypotenuse here. The Pythagorean theorem does not work on a curve. Not yet, at least. All right? I just got like 50% new knowledge right now. Say that again? I got like 50% I got 50 new knowledge. 50% new knowledge? That's pretty good. Um, you'll probably have a headache in about 30 minutes, and it's going to be a lot to fit in there. Now, let's go to what Bree started asking me about, or answering me about. Best circle I've ever drawn one. Bree, what kind of angle do we have here? Do you know the name of that guy? I'll start getting, we'll play Will of Fortunes. Yep. So I just need Bree to tell me that. No, you're good. Inscribed angle, perfect. Now, the inscribed angle, can we call this IA? Right, for inscribed angle. The measure of IA, or the inscribed angle, is one half the measure of the arc. So let's call this AB. Let's make that even more. The measure of angle C is one half of arc AB. Kind of makes sense, right? I'm going to force you guys to do this one last time with me. It just looks like a triangle. It kind of is, except for this curved part, right? Uh, Sydney, how many, how many sides on this polygon right here? A, B, C. All, I'm, all I want to do is reinforce that as soon as you have a curve, you have an infinite number of points of tangency, so it's an infinite part. Oh, yeah, no, don't. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, this is why we never trust our eyes on this stuff. Now, if I do this, right, that angle is going to be right here. And I can see that the greater the angle is, the more my hands have to go apart. That's creating a greater part. So it kind of makes sense that anything I do here, let's not call it any, that's central angle. Let's just call it A. Anything I do to A, this part out here is going to be 2A degrees. 
To go from the little guy on the inside to the big guy on the outside, it's twice. So, your name, I believe you answered the last question. Pick anybody you want for me. Don't say for him. I just saw you look at the back of his head, and I picked on that poor guy so many times. All right, Abby, if angle A, or if the measure of A is 40, what is the measure of arc AB? 80, perfect. Because here, A is 40. 40 times 2 is 80. Now, because we're able to do this, if this is 2a, and this is a, if I divide this by 2, don't I go back to a, right? So the other thing we can say is the measure of arc AB is 2 times the measure of angle which is already onto this place. I don't know why I wanted to state that explicitly, but what I want to show is here. Abby, pick somebody for me. Make sure it's somebody that's good with dividing the two. All right, Becca, if this out here, AB is 130 degrees. What's the measure and let's introduce conditionals. What is the measure of angle B? 65 degrees. 65, perfect. So the way I remember this, if I know that a central angle, we have N and N, in my mind, if I start here and I go to here, that's a radius. If I go twice as far, I'm here. So if you think about it, to go from here to here, it's a central angle where they're equal, but I have to do that twice, so I have two times the distance. That's how I put it in my mind. All right? Um, yeah, so it's your diameter. Yeah, that's exactly it. That special chord. And the diameter is twice the radius. There's so many ways to kind of help you stick that in your mind. Uh, again, I'll give Sydney a thank you in person because the alligator thing still works so well. Um, kind of sad that I'll never teach geometry again while I'm here, but we'll see. Maybe I'll be back. All right. Any questions on how to bounce back and forth on these? It looks like it looks like this is so much. <laughs>